Yes, Lord. Has he been faithful to you, Point Harbor? Has he provided for you? Has he forgiven you? Has he strengthened you? The psalmist say, enter his gates with what? And enter his courts with? Now, y'all are like, Johnny, we're already there, bro. <laughs> but think of something. One thing that you can be thankful for. One thing he's given you this week. You got it? And just say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. You are faithful. You are able. And you are in control. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We, we need you, Holy Spirit, God. Do your work in this place. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture, Lord. We stand before you. We surrender to your word. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen. amen. Yeah, it's good to see you, Point Harbor. Y'all show some love to Shelby and the band. They already escaped. Now, uh, we are jumping back into our Genesis series today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 37. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a blue one in front of you. We're going to be on page 34 in that Bible. And today we are introduced to a brand new character in the series, a young man named Joseph. Y'all heard of Joseph? Yeah? What are some things that Joseph is known for? Just holler it out. A coat, a coat of many colors. What else is Joseph known for? Dreams, dreams. That's what I was looking for. The story of Joseph kicks off with Joseph dreaming. Dreaming of who he's going to become one day. Dreams of power and prosperity. And isn't that how many of us start off? Dreaming, right? Well, I find the girl of my dreams. Will I find that dream job, live in that dream home, drive that dream car, lots of dreams. Most young people go into the world with high hopes, smiles on their faces, full of excitement and anticipation, but life doesn't always go as planned, does it? No. I was scrolling through some reels the other day. <laughs> I came across some storm chasers, some Christian storm chasers. I'm like, man, that's a first, right? I looked at one of the pictures. It's a tornado, and the guy said, live in the dream. I'm like, okay, cool. I clicked on one of the videos, and uh, there's a car full of young men, pretty excited, you know, trying to get that tornado on film. But, hmm, sadly, things did not go as planned. Shall we have a look? What's up, man? Go, go, straight, 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 straight. Here you go. Oh, wow. We'll be okay. Yeah, we'll still make it seem like it's okay right now. I, I get it, I get it. Oh, my gosh! Oh! Lord Jesus, please protect us in the name of Jesus. Oh! Um, Fernando's right next to us, right here. Oh, no. Holy shoot. Calm down. Thank you, Jesus, for protecting us in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that you're going to protect us right now. Please, Lord. Please, Lord. What a nightmare, right? For many of us, there was a time where we looked forward and dreamed of what could be. But then harsh reality hit back hard. Instead of living a dream, we're stuck in a nightmare. Hurt, depressed, deflated, looking back on what could have been, what should have been. Kind of like Napoleon Dynamite's Uncle Rico. You remember that guy? How much you want to bet I could throw a football over the mountains, right? If coach would have put me in last quarter, we would have been state champions. I don't know why I know that. <laughs> Joseph, the dreamer, will soon discover that life doesn't always go as planned, or at least as we plan it. But God is faithful. Amen? God is able. God is in control, and God has a plan. All right, let's jump in. Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. 
Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. Now stop right there. Joseph is the second youngest of 12 brothers. The author says, hey, these are the generations of Jacob. And then he skips past every older brother until he gets to Joseph. Why is that significant? Well, do you remember when we learned about Joseph's dad, Jacob? Was Jacob the older, stronger brother or the younger? Okay. I thought I was wrong for a second. I'm like, what? In a culture of me first and I've earned it, God turns the table on human expectation, on human wisdom, and picks the weak. I mean, God's ways are not our ways. He doesn't seek out the oldest or the strongest or the wisest. Joseph was younger and weaker. His father Jacob was younger and weaker. Remember Cain and Abel? Abel was younger. King David was the youngest of all his brothers. David was still delivering DoorDash when his older brothers were at war. Remember that? But who did God choose to take down that giant? Young David. Here is a peek into the mind of God, into the logic of God. 1 Corinthians. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Have you ever seen a proud Christian? Have you ever seen an arrogant church person? Right? Walking around like they're the deal. Look at me, look at what I've become. Thank God for, well, me. (laughs) There will be no proud people in heaven. Not one. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Jesus did it. Not me. Jesus. We are weak, but he is strong. We are foolish, but he is wise. We have failed a lot, but he is faithful. God chooses the weak. My friend, are you feeling weak today? You're in really good company. The old famous preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, God does not need your strength. He has plenty of that. He wants your weakness. He has none of that. He is longing to take your weakness and use it as the instrument of his own mighty hand. The apostle Paul cried out to Jesus and said, Lord, take this thorn off my side. Take this weakness. I can do so much more for you, God. It's slowing me down. And what did Jesus say? My grace is sufficient for you. Chill. My power is made perfect in weakness. Martin Luther had it absolutely right when he said, we are all beggars. It's not our strength. We rely on his constant supply. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And God is about to shake some things up and humble his people. Look at verse 2. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Oof. (laughs) Nobody likes a snitch. What do they say? Snitches get... uh, Ouch. The author of the book of Genesis is Moses. And what Moses is communicating to his readers is not primarily that Joseph is a bratty little snitch that nobody likes. Rather, he wants us to know that Joseph is the righteous brother. He's the faithful son. He doesn't go along with the crowd. His older brothers are doing something unrighteous and unfaithful. But Joseph, 
being younger and weaker, could have easily gone with the flow, right? But he remained faithful to his father, and his brothers began to hate him. Now, does that remind you of anybody else? A beloved son, despised and rejected by his own? Hmm. Now, Joseph, like every other faithful servant of God, is still flawed, amen? And faithful, flawed servants come from flawed homes. Amen? Joseph's parents, Jacob and Rachel, they were flawed. Jacob's parents, Isaac and Rebekah, man, they were flawed. And Isaac's parents, Abraham and Sarah, man, they were flawed too. Don't believe me? Just watch the tapes. Right? I was going to say, ask the dishes. But anyway, the whole family tree is a little messed up. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that the patriarchs and the people that God used were not perfect people? Where would our hope come from? I don't know about you, but I would be completely hopeless at this point if the only people that God ever used were free from flaw and failure. People who never made mistakes or messed anything up. If God only loved and chose to use perfect people, there would be no hope for us. But guess what? There would also be no grace. And God is gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He wants to forgive. He loves to heal. He is faithful. Verse 3. Now Israel, as Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Parents picking favorites is what drove Jacob and his brother Esau apart, right? And here's Jacob doing the same thing to his sons. The brothers most likely hated Joseph because they were sure he was going to get the bigger portion of the inheritance. He was going to get the firstborn portion. Now look what happens, verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gather around it and bow down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. And then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were all bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. That's some pretty big dreams, right? Guys, I've had a dream. Guess what? You guys are all going to bow down to me. <laughs> but here's the thing about dreams and dreamers. Those weren't his daydreams. Those weren't his lofty goals. God gave him those dreams. God was revealing what God was going to do. And Joseph's dreams were way bigger than Joseph. God will use Joseph to save an entire nation and preserve the covenantal family. And through that family, specifically the line of Judah, the Messiah would come to save the entire world. Now here's the question for all you dreamers out there. Are you dreaming of God's glory or are you dreaming of your glory? Are your goals centered on your greatness or God's? Who are you pointing people to? You or Christ? 
Now let us remember, we are not the main character in a story that we're writing. That's all about us, right? God is the author. God is the director. Christ has the lead role. It's his power and purpose that prevails. His name that will be praised. His glory on display forever. Anything less than infinite, almighty God is a short-lived, poor substitute. I mean, just look at the sports heroes we grew up watching, right? They got rusty and crusty. Just look at our rock stars. Have you seen the Rolling Stones lately? They should change their name to the Crypt Keepers. Many of the celebrities we have idolized throughout the decades are already dust. The Apostle Peter says, All people are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Listen to this. We either ride the big waves of his eternal glorious grace or we drown in the kiddie pool of our own vanity. The human heart is never satisfied with mere idols of silver or self. God wants more for you than this world could ever offer. The scripture says God has set eternity in our hearts. Man, no wonder billionaires want more money. No wonder, the, no wonder world rulers want more power. Always consuming, never satisfied. Christ said, even if you gain the whole world, man, you can still lose your soul. Here's the truth. We were made for God. Only everlasting life with our eternal good God can satisfy us. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. I mean, can you just imagine? God is telling us, if you gain everything this big world can offer you, it won't be big enough for your soul. And maybe that's why so many of us are so bored. We've been looking to the world. We've been looking to a person. We've been looking to ourself to fill a void. Man, it's, it's not enough. If you want your soul to soar, if you want your heart on flames, walk with Jesus who made your heart. A few days after Jesus was crucified, two disciples were walking down the road towards town. They were depressed, discouraged, not sure of what to think of rumors and reports of an empty tomb. And surprisingly, the risen Christ himself meets them there, right in the middle of the road, right in the middle of their doubt, right in the middle of their confusion. And the lights started to flicker again. Sparks began to fly again. Look at what they said, Luke 24. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Man, I want to be on fire. I want to soar. And how did these disciples feel the renewed sparks in their heart? How did they do it? They walked and talked with Jesus. The scriptures were opened. What about you? What about you? Has it gotten cold? Has it gotten dark? God is telling us, hey, open up the scriptures. Hear my written, written voice. Call upon the light of the world. Spend time with me. Spend some time with me, man. I had this friend. We were like 10 years old. So I don't know if this story is actually true, right? <laughs> <clears throat> but he's like, yeah, my dad was working in our house, and 
he was working on some electric stuff. And all of a sudden, his ring, like, it just kind of grazed one of the wires and it shot him across the room. I'm like, man, that's insane, right? That's kind of like being with God. All you need is just to see him, to reach out, spend some time with him. Now, someone might say, oh, Johnny, hold on, hold on, Johnny. Wait a second. Those two guys... Man, they actually saw Jesus, right? They actually saw him. Okay, I'll give you that. I'm sure there's another level of blaze when we see him face to face. But my friends, we have the spirit of Christ within us. Jesus said, I'm with you always. This isn't some dusty religion or some dull ritual like we check a box every Sunday and pretend our prayers are heard and hope that heaven is real. This is eternal life now to know him. And we're going to start to see this in Joseph's life. Look at verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now. See if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. Now, does this remind you of anybody else? A father sending a faithful son. Look at this. A divine appointment. Verse 15. So he sent him, excuse me, from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. I might need a uh, water over there, if one of y'all can bring me that little water. What's up, Shelby? Thank you, sir. Y'all show him a round of applause while I drink this. All right. I want you to notice something here. Verse 15, a man found him wandering in the fields. Underline that in your Bible. I'm going to pull up Pastor John. Underline wandering, circle in the field. (laughs) And the man asked him, what are you seeking? And Joseph said, I'm seeking my brothers. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, oh, they've gone away. For I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. It's a five-day journey from the valley of Hebron to Dothan. And Joseph is found wandering the fields. You ever feel like you've been wandering? Going in circles, man. Like, you're not where you used to be, but you're not where you want to be. Somewhere in the middle, in a holding pattern. Now, this may feel like a delay, but there are other things at play here. Joseph would never find his brothers if it wasn't for this random guy who shows up and finds him wandering. Joseph will miss his ride to Egypt unless he has this delay, this wandering. God's timing is perfect even in our wandering. God is still working, man, even when it doesn't seem like anything's happening. God gave Joseph the dream, and now it is being set into motion. Even in the wandering, God is directing Joseph's steps. There's a scripture that says, do not despise the day of small things. Point number one in your handout. While the plan may still be unfolding, God's purpose always stands. The Lord says in Isaiah 46, I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come? I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. I remember moving to Nashville in my 20s, chasing a dream, man. I wanted that record deal, you know what I'm saying? Y'all heard this story before. Got a little twist on it, though. Long story short, here's what happened. I went broke. (laughs) Went broke. Uh, I got sick. I lost my voice, couldn't sing, started losing gigs, 
and then uh, drove back home, and then totaled my car. This is like all in about a week. I'm like, what is going on, man? What is this? I felt like I was just wandering and waiting, going in circles. Man, I got to save up some money. I got to fix my car. I got to call my contacts. I got to get back to Nashville. But here's the thing. While I was wandering, I met a woman, a good woman. (laughs) And I remember calling my buddy in Nashville. I'm like, hey, bro, I know I'm still paying rent. I know we have contacts. I'm not coming back. (laughs) I found the one. I found the one. I never would have met my wife if I didn't get in a car wreck, get sick, leave Nashville. I would have been there the whole time, dude. I wasn't coming back. God was still working in that wandering, though. Even when you're like, what's going? What? What does this mean? Who cares what it means? He's directing your steps. All right, verse 15. The brothers saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. We will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben, the firstborn, heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Whoa, 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 let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness. But do not lay a hand on him, that he, that Reuben, might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. A bright, young 17-year-old, full of promise and potential, now stripped in the bottom of a pit. Man, talk about a setback, right? I mean, whoa, I'm derailed from my dream, thrown into a nightmare. God, what, where are you at, God? Do you see me down here? This cannot be part of your plan for me. It's too painful. Right? You ever been derailed from a dream and the pain has got you wondering, what? Has God forgotten me? Maybe you're not wandering in the fields looking for directions. Maybe you're wounded in the bottom of a pit. But God works miracles in the pits, does he? Daniel got thrown into a pit of lions, but God was with him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown into a pit of flames, but God was with him. Jesus Christ was put into a pit of death, but was that the end? The pit is not the end of the story. God raised him. And whether you have been thrown into the pit or you stumbled in all on your own, I want to share something with you. This passage saved my life. I think it's honest to say that. I was trapped in the pit of my own anger and vengeance. Man, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but have you ever prayed for God to kill anybody? I sure have. Remember when Jesus said, even if you hate your brother, you're guilty of being a murderer? Hi, I'm Johnny. I'm a murderer. I was caught into a pit of anger. And if you are here and you're struggling with anger, and I think many of you are, because it seems every time I say something about me struggling with anger, I see the wife kind of nudge the husband, like, yeah, you too. Right? I think there's many of us here. So listen to this. Or if you want revenge, or if you're waiting for justice, please memorize this passage. Psalm 37, fret not yourself because of evildoers, and be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice 
as the noonday. God will not fail. God is faithful. Amen? The pit is not the end of your story. Point number two. Our Heavenly Father does not forget. He will mend and avenge His children. What do the Scriptures say? Do not avenge yourself. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Man, God can do a lot better job than you can. You cannot handle the vengeance that you deserve. Think about that. You tried to avenge yourself, it would kill you under the weight. Only God can handle that. God is with you in the pit. He's been there before. (laughs) He knows how to free you. Look at this next verse. Psalm 118. Out of my distress I called to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Y'all, what is your only offensive weapon in the spiritual fight? It's the sword of the spirit. Everything else is defensive. Taking the blows. Can you imagine a UFC fighter just (laughs) buckling up? Defensive. Never striking. That's how many of us are. Just holding on. Oh, here comes another wave of attack. Oh, God, help me. God says, fight. You fight through his word. You put this in your heart and in your mind and you speak his scripture. I mean, that's the only way out. Last thing about the pit. Your story does not end in the pit because the resurrection is all the proof we need. Amen? It's not over. All right, verse 28. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Whoa. Now who does that remind you of? Sold for silver. They sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Joseph's trip to the top, his ride to royalty starts with him being sold into slavery. Wow. I know that was not part of his plan, but it was part of God's plan. Amen. He was taken over 500 miles away from his home. And it gets worse for Joseph. Do you remember? Homeboy gets thrown into prison. Like just when it's starting to get good, he's in Potiphar's house being faithful. He's like, all right, yes, Lord, the Lord is faithful. I see it. This is how I get to the top. Oh, shoot, I'm in prison. The rest of the book of Genesis, 13 chapters in total, is all about Joseph. I mean, how many characters have we gone through? How many people? In the last 25, 27%, Joseph and Joseph's family waiting for a dream. Point number three, God is with us in the waiting. He is with us in the waiting. Joseph waits 22 years before he sees this dream come true. Man, that's a lot of suffering, bro. Right? That's a long nightmare. God... Do you see me? Hello, have you forgotten me? Aren't you glad that God does not forget? We forget. Actually, let me speak for myself. I forget (laughs) a lot. In fact, when I was a young single man, for some reason, people in the church would be like, hey man, if you want your dogs watched, ask Johnny. Just fill the refrigerator and leave him some cash. He'll come watch your dogs. Okay? Uh, It's so random, right? Well, anyway, (laughs) I'm walking in the church lobby one day. I'm like, this is the Lord's day. Enter his courts with thanksgiving. I see a couple waiting for me in the lobby. They were not smiling. They were not happy. And they came up to me. They said, Johnny, did you forget about something? I'm like, 
Did I forget about something? <gasps> oh, shoot. I was supposed to watch their dogs for like a week while they were out of town. I was supposed to feed their dogs and give them water and take them outside. The only thing I could think of was, Jesus, please don't let those dogs be dead. Please. I'm like those dudes in that tornado. Please, Lord, please, please don't let those dogs be dead. And I look up at them and they say, in case you were wondering, they're still alive. I'm like, thank you, God. He is merciful. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God does not forget about you? Right? God does not forget. He's not looking down at Joseph. <laughs> saying, oh my gosh, I gave that dude a dream 20 years ago. I forgot all about him. Oh, let me see where he's at now. He's in prison. Oh, no. I got to do something. Joseph, I'm coming. I'm running a little late here. Uh, LOL and nervous face emoji. I'm, I'll be right there. Every step. Joseph's every step was directed by God. God was moving him with precision towards the destination. From wandering to the pit, to Potiphar's house, to the prison, to the palace. God's hand was directing everything according to plan. So my friends, whether you are here, you're living the dream, you're on the top, or it feels more like a nightmare, God is with you. He is faithful. He is able. He is in control. Amen? He hasn't forgot about you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your your grace. We thank you for your sovereignty, God. We thank you for what you've done in the past, recorded it for us, that we might trust in you, that we might know that you are trustworthy. You are faithful to us, Lord. We thank you. I just want to take a couple seconds. If you are here and you're wandering, or maybe you're in the pit, or maybe you feel locked up. Just say, Lord, here I am. Like the thief on the cross, say, Lord, remember me. And believe that he sees you. Believe that he knows you. He knows what you need. He loves you. Jesus, thank you for your love. Encourage our hearts now. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. We honor you and we love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen.